So tax incidents revisited and their effect on price elasticity. Recall when taxes may be legally assessed on buyers or sellers, the tax incidence is generally shared. Tax incidence is the actual division of the tax bur of the burden of a tax between the buyer and sellers in a market. Tax incidence can be thought of as who really pays the taxes, as distinct from who is legally obligated to pay the taxes. This is kind of the same conversation that we have related to what happens if there is an increase in minimum wage. Well, the business must pay the employer employee the minimum wage. But who really pays for that? Is it the, do the corporations take it out of profits or do they pass the cost on to the consumers? And that kind of depends on the relative price elasticities of demand and supply determined, determines the tax incidence. So let's talk about the effects of price elasticity on tax incidence. The figure shows a 10%, $0.10 cents per gallon tax on gasoline. So the federal government has said there's an excise tax on gasoline. This, of course, shifts the supply curve from S1 supply to S2, which means you will supply less of the product at, uh, at the same price, right? So, and here is the demand curve, D2. So while it this is legally assessed on the sellers, the price buyers pay increase of two cents. Therefore, the buyers have 20 cent, 20% 20 of the tax burden. So realistically, there here is A, and it shifts to C, which is three dollars and two cents, which includes two cents of the 10 cents tax. Now, however, if a buyer had less price elastic demand for gasoline, they would just adjust their purchases less in response to price changes. In this case, the price by price buyers pay ends up being an eight cent, which means they pay eighty percent of the effective tax. So on a ten cents per gallon, if this was the demand curve, they would pay three oh eight compared to the three dollars. Therefore, their the tax incidence is relative to price elasticities of demand and supply curves. Making the connection, who really feels the tax burden of corporate income taxes? Corporations are not people. All taxes paid by corporations eventually are paid by people. But taxes on corporate income discourage investment in, in corporations, reducing capital available to firms, worker productivity, and wages. In fact, the Congressional Budget Office estimates that the excess burden from corporate income tax may be half as large as the tax revenue generated, therefore making it a very inefficient form of tax. This is what many people argue is the reason against having either having corporate tax or having such a high corporate tax rate because it makes everything inefficient. So now we're going to discuss um, income distribution and poverty. And this can be a very heated topic, but we're going to discuss this in economic terms. Discuss the distribution of income in the United States and understand the extent of income mobility. There are always relatively rich and relatively poor people within every society. Whether or not there is a best, quote unquote, amount of inequality is an open and very much normative question. So a more straightforward question to ask is, how has the income distribution in the United States changed over time? How do tax systems affect the income distribution? And how does the income distribution in the United States compare with other countries? Okay. The, income, the, the distribution of household income in the United States, this is based on 2015. So 24% of households have annual income. The sources are estimated by the Urban, Urban Brooks Tax Policy Center table, published June 2013 to June 23, 2015. So 24% of all households have annual income here, 22%, 22%, 9%, 16%, and then 7%. The first table shows the various tax brackets. Without context, it is hard to evaluate. Now, we can achieve some context by considering how the income distribution has changed over time. Like, is this good? Is this bad? I don't, you know, that's the question. So, the percentage of U.S. population in poverty. So, in the 1960s, it was slightly more than in between 20 and 25 percent. So, I'm going to guess like 22 percent. I'm looking directly at this graph. And then it started to go down over time, and then it went back up. And here we are, and this is 
about 15%. So how many Americans are quote unquote poor and what does it mean to be poor? The federal government defines a, a household as poor if it fits annual cash income below the poverty line. A level of annual income equal to three times the amount of money necessary to purchase the min minimum quantity of food required for adequate nutrition. The poverty rate above, shown above, is the percentage of the population that is poor according to the federal government's definition. Decreases in poverty rate in the 1960s came largely from the expansion of Social Security. Poverty rates among, across various groups in 2014. Different groups within society have different poverty rates. We have the total population of a poverty rate of 14.8. But if you look at female head of household, no husband present, all races, 30.6. So this is the biggest contributing factor, a female as the head of household with no husband present. Blacks, 26.2%. Hispanics, 23.6%. Asians, 12%. White, not Hispanic, 10%. But if they are married couples of all races, the poverty rate is now 6.2%. So the Lorenz, Lorenz curve in the Gini coefficient. So a Lorenz curve shows the distribution of income by array, arraying incomes from the lowest to highest on the horizontal axis and indicating the cumulative fraction of income earned by each household on the vertical axis. The curve shows from the uh, figures from 1980 to 2014. If incomes were perfectly equal, the Lorenzo curve would be diagonal line line of perfect equal distribution. The large area between the actual curve and the perfect equality curve, the more, the larger the area, the more unequal the income becomes. Perfect equality in incomes would be a coefficient, a, a Gini coefficient of zero. If all incomes were earned by one person, the coefficient would be one. So there are a bunch of problems in measuring poverty and income distribution. Our measures so far may be misleading as to the truth and nature of poverty. One, they ignore income mobility. Two, they ignore the effects of government programs meant to reduce poverty. We will address these shortcomings in the following slides. So income inequality is more concerning if people are permanently poor and or rich. The figure shows a substantial amount of income mobility even in a short period of time. Example, only 69.1% of households who were in the lowest 20% in 2004 continued to be in the lowest 20% in 2007. That means income mobility. I believe that we come back to this graph, I'll make sure. Income inequality is also less concerning if actions of the government reduce the income inequality. Federal income taxes are progressive, automatically reducing income inequality. There are also transfer payments to individuals from the government, like Social Security and unemployment benefits. These, the figures we have seen before taxes, the figures that we have seen previously are before taxes and transfer payments. Income inequality after these is substantially smaller. Also, many poor people receive non-cash benefits like SNAP, which is Supplemental Nutritional Assistance Program or food stamp benefits and housing benefits so that further reduce these income inequalities. There is a substantial debate on over how much action the government ought to take in this regard. I ask the question to you, what do you think? So the effects of tax, the effect, the effect of taxes and transfers on the distribution of household income in 2011. So we have to go back a little further so that we can apply all the information that we have. Now, this is the ratio of highest income to other income before taxes and transfers. Now, this is reduced almost in half, almost, in certain tax brackets. So the table shows how much the ratio of income earned by the highest earners to the other quantiles changed due to the taxes and transfer payments without considering the top earners, uh, the top earns about 15 times with the bottom. This drops to eight times after taxes and transfers. The marginal productivity theory of income distribution, which is in chapter 17, suggests that each factor of production, including labor, is paid its marginal revenue product. A worker's productivity depends in part on his or her human capital. 
the accumulated knowledge and skills that workers acquire from formal training and education and from life experiences. Since human capital is not distributed equally across workers, neither will, in, neither will income be. Similarly, ownership of factors of production such as capital are not distributed equally either. In Table 18.6 showed that income inequality in the United States has been rising over the past few decades. Some factors that help explain this include rapid technology changes that have decreased the demand for unskilled workers relative to skilled workers. This creates an income inequality. Expanding international trade has had the same effect. Increased immigration, legal and not legal, have brought more unskilled workers to the United States. These also have increased the income earned by capital owners, and since capital owners are generally richer, this also increases what, we, what is in, called income inequality. Other factors. Assortative mating. The tendency for men and women of similar educational backgrounds to marry has increased substantially since 1960. This raises income inequality across households. If no sorting on educational backgrounds took place, the coefficient would fall from 0.545 to 0.34. Luck. Like much else in life, incomes are subject to good and bad luck. Policies to reduce income inequality. Taxes and transfers. So, the table 18.8 showed that these have a substantial effect on income inequality. Raising taxes could do more, but marginal, high marginal tax rates may slow economic growth and lead to tax avoidance. The question becomes, will you take your money off seas? Will, people, will corporations move out, which has happened with inversion, in order to avoid paying taxes, which doesn't technically make the income inequality go away, right? Improving human capital. Many politicians have proposed increased funding for education and apprenticeship programs. What the government ought to do to reduce income inequality, and indeed whether or not, whether it ought to do so, is likely to remain controversial. Who are the 1% and how do they earn their income? Households earning above 700,000 are considered the top 1% of income earners in the United States. These figures show what industry these households earn their income from. Perhaps surprisingly, the current wealthy are more likely to be first in their family to run a firm and less likely to have been born into the wealth than, than that was true in the 80s, which means now it's more likely that their first generation running a business or running a firm and making this money than the fact that they were born into wealth. So 31% come from executives non-finance. 15.7 are from doctors and other, other medical professions. 13.9%, these are all the household incomes over seven, are, are financial professionals. 8.4 are lawyers. 4.6 are engineers or other technical non-finance workers. 1.6 are in the arts and media and sports. And then other is 24.8%, which couldn't have been lumped into any of these categories. So where does the United States rank compared to the rest of the world? The table shows the ratio received by the highest 20% to that received by the lowest 20%. Interpreting this data is made more difficult. Remember, this is based purely without taking into consideration federal programs that we have to transfer money and give tax incentives back to low-income individuals. This could, this could change this, so take that into account. Whenever you see these statistics, they are always skewed by how are you counting this. So let's talk about poverty in the world has decreased or declined dramatically since 1970. So in the developing world, 26.8% in the 70s, uh, to 2010, 4.5%. .4, in East Asia, look at this, 58.8%, 11.5%, and then 0.4%. Southeast Asia, the Middle East, Latin America, and the Sub-Saharan sub African Africa. Improvements in the level of poverty have been significant over the last few decades, but poverty rates remain high in parts of the world, particularly sub-Saharan Africa, which has seen much lower levels of economic growth than, let's say, the Asian countries. And so this was part two of chapter 18.